it's great to have an opportunity to talk with you, even though we're only separated by one very thin wall. I feel like I, I hear the Aaron side of a lot of conversations with, uh, with journalists, um, but I never get to ask my own questions. So here it is. Uh, I, I read recently uh, a figure that I think was numbered in the trillions of dollars counting up U.S. investments in security and conflict resolution in the Middle East over something like three decades. Uh, that's a level that's a fraction of the U.S. GDP. I mean, that's real money. And the question that I always have is, why? Why, why this chunk of the world? Why such an enormous and disproportionate American commitment to this chunk of the world? You know, is it, is it oil? What is it? You know, it's partly positive in the sense that uh, Americans, Muslim, Christians, and Jews are drawn to a compelling part of the world, which some argue, at least from, in terms of Western religion, the center of the world. Mm -hmm. That's why the issue of Jerusalem is so important mm -hmm. and so evocative and, and, and resonant. But I would argue, in large part, it's, it's driven by negative factors. Uh, we have allies, we have interests, and we have adversaries. And the Middle East is dysfunctional and broken, never having worked on this area for most of my professional career in government um, and as an analyst have I seen a, a time when the situation is so so complicated. Mm -hmm. It's partly oil. We're weaning ourselves off of Arab hydrocarbons, but the rest of the world is not. And as long as 40% of the year's known petroleum reserves end up flowing through the na through narrow straits and through the Gulf, we're going to have a stake in, in quote unquote stability there, which is an intriguing and elusive concept. You also have the problem of nuclear weapons. And right. we've seen, um, Iran's program develop and a nuclear agreement in the previous administration designed to constrain and, res and, and restrain it. Plus you have, in the wake of 9-11, right. a variety of transnational groups which uh, are, take advantage of uh, broken states and right. uh, empty spaces in order to plot, plan, and uh, not just to do harm to uh, uh, governments which they find illegitimate, but ultimately to plan attacks against the West. So for all these reasons, we have no choice but to not be there. The question is, what are our interests and what can we do there? You, but So, Aaron, you put two markers out which are kind of opposite ends of one spectrum. One is the, well, we don't have a choice. This is what we must do, you know, to avoid nuclear holocaust, to avoid, you know, such regional chaos that, you know, tens of millions of people are spilling out of the region, et cetera. Uh, and then the other is kind of almost ideological, religious, aspirational. But we're a very commercial country. We're a country built, you know, on world trade and on investment and building business. Um, all the more so now when we have a, a businessman president. Uh, the transaction's got to be premised on some reasonable expectation of an output or an outcome. Are our expectations of the Middle East reasonable or unreasonable? Do they match reality in any way? Well, I think they would match reality if we looked at the region with re through a lens of realism. If, in fact, we looked at the world the way it is rather than preternaturally believing it's always the way we want it to be. And the fact is, in the three core interests I, I identified, oil, counterterrorism, and the prevention of any single regional hegemon emerging with a nuclear weapon, Fact is, we're not doing badly. Now, the rest of the Middle East is a mess. You have a dysfunctional a Arab world. The Arab Spring went south, into a, morphed into a winter, mm -hmm. and it may be decades before it, it, some sort of semblance of stability and functional governance will be, will be restored. Mm -hmm. So by and large, if we adopt a transactional, not a transformational view of the region, if we look at this, and it's hard for Americans because of the value proposition Take the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Right now, there is no solution to this conflict. And yet we continue to aspire to one that goes beyond our capacity to achieve. You ever heard the expression, in the history of the world, nobody ever washed a rental car? People don't wash rental cars because they care only about what they own. And the truth is, Israelis and Palestinians bring insufficient ownership to right, this. So right. if they don't have that sense of so, propri pr proprietorship, how can we instill it? So other than world policemen, why do we own the Middle East so much? Why not you know, China, the other huge percentage of the global economy? Uh, why not Russia, historically a major outside power in the Middle East? Uh, why not, you know, okay, we don't want hegemons, but other major regional powers. Well, it depends on what the issue is. I mean, despite our dysfunction and, the, and our own imperfections and failures in, in many policies over the years, we are still looked to. We have credibility. We have a relationship with the Israelis, uh, however difficult it may be, that is closer than most. 
the Gulf states depend largely on American security guarantees, not on European, not on Russian security guarantees. And we continue uh, 50 years after uh, the creation of the, Wil of the Woodrow Wilson Center in many respects still to be looked at as a power, and I realize the risks of what I'm about to say, that essentially re reflect a certain, a certain measure of idealism. Mm. Uh, we've also become a source of the region's problems. Right. The, Iraq, uh, the Iraq War, uh, to name uh, one of the most, uh, I, I think, galactic mistakes uh, that we've made. But my, I guess my point in the end, Matt, is that we're stuck there. Right. We can't transform the region. We can't <coughs> extricate ourselves from it. So. And it seems I would to me argue we're, you transact. We're giving over an inherent advantage, and this may be the the unavoidable vulnerability of the leader of the pack. But we give over an inherent advantage to those that have more narrowly defined interests that come in, like the Russians in Syria, uh, like the Chinese doing you know ag deals in Africa or energy deals in the Middle East or wherever it may be, uh, and we kind of foot the bill for a bigger context conflict prevention, hegemon prevention, nuclear disaster prevention, and then the others kind of strike opportunistically. I mean, isn't, isn't yes. that the disproportionality that, I, that I so agree. many Americans hate? I agree. And the, the others also seem to know what they want, uh, have limited goals, don't have these uh, galactic aspirations. Right. Uh, I mentioned, you know, we, we're like a modern day Gulliver wandering around in a part of the world that we don't understand, tied up by tiny tribes whose yeah. interests are not our own and our own illusions. I'm not sure, sure Vladimir Putin, this is a good segue. I'm not sure Vladimir Putin uh, has the same galactic aspirations to fix this, solve that, right. dominate this. So let me ask you about Putin, because uh, I never get a chance to talk to you about this. Um, you can't talk about Russia without talking about Putin. And I guess my first question is why, or what is it about Putin that you think we don't get? Well, you know, I'd say a couple things. Number one, you're, you're right to presume that uh, Putin, for all of his high-flying rhetoric and, and the sort of outsized personality, uh, he is the senior man on the international stage, right? Two decades leading one of the world's major powers. There's, there's no one who, who comes close to that. Uh, on the world stage right now, despite all of that, he, he is pretty flexible and opportunistic. He's he's not especially doctrinaire. He's not known as a grand strategist, despite this sort of three-dimensional chess stuff. Uh, it feels that way when we get outplayed, but that doesn't mean that he's been playing chess all along. Good point. Um, but I think more than anything, what we don't understand about Putin is kind of the same thing he doesn't understand about us, which is we're just really bad at talking to each other. So, so as an example, let me give you uh, a concrete example here. Um, what you often have are these kind of just very tenuous, very hesitant interactions between Russians and Americans, where Russians will come to the table with what they think is a modest but still significant offer that, you know, took a lot of juice internally to gin this up, to defend their flank against the nationalist radical critics, you know, et cetera. Um, we can denigrate that and say, oh, but it's an authoritarian top-down system, so they just do whatever Putin wants to do. That's only partly true, right? The guy has significant constraints within the system. So they come to the table with an offer. They put it out there. We hear the offer. Maybe we do the exact same thing with an offer of our own. We then go back and consider it, or maybe we consider it on the spot, and our answer is no, or it's one of these non-answers that you know very well from diplomacy is sort right. of tantamount to a no. And then we each commit the ultimate fallacy of failed communication, and that is we presume that the other's motive was disingenuous or was negative, rather than that the same reasons why we <laughs> couldn't get the deal very, done very good on deal. our side pretty much apply with a different context on their side. And we do this over and over and over, and we've been doing it since the 1990s with post-Soviet Russia. So are we alike? Uh, I, I know you made this point before. Yeah. Forget our systems. But yeah. are, are, do Americans and Russians really have a lot in common? Well, I, compared to what? First of all, so I, I just, uh, together with uh, our colleague Robert Daly, who, who heads the Kissinger Institute on China, we literally did an around-the-world trip, and we started in China and, and ended in Moscow and flew back here. Uh, and, you know, one of the observations that struck both of us, frankly, is that there are a lot of ways in which uh, Americans and Chinese have a kind of uh, more fluid and functional dialogue, and we certainly have a lot at stake economically to have that dialogue. Um, but on, on certain really fundamental levels, there were common assumptions in our conversations with Russians. Didn't mean we agreed, 
about the subject matter, but common assumptions about what ought to be discussed and what language we ought to use to discuss it, that we had much more in common with Russians than with our Chinese interlocutors. That was, that was a fascinating takeaway for me that you only get when you get outside your comfort zone. So in that sense, I think we have a fair amount in common. On the other hand, in the narrower sense of kind of the Euro-Atlantic world, right, 50% of global GDP, you know, for the last 70 years, the dominant uh, presence on the international stage, we're at loggerheads, right? We do business in radically different ways. We have radically different political systems. We have surprisingly similar narratives about ourselves and the roles that we've played in the history of this region and our, our respective uh, civilizations, but they tend to be destructively interfering narratives, right? They're, they're narratives, neither of which leaves room for the other. The French can be a great nation, which also helped us achieve our independence. The Russians would argue they did the exact same thing, but in defining and staking out American greatness, think about speechifying American presidents and secretaries of state, it is almost always zero sum with uh, Russian and sometimes also Chinese nefariousness, right? Those two things can never occupy the same space, and we've never found a way to accommodate each other in that way. Our narrative to the Russians is almost always, well, be like us, and then you can be great and prosperous and at peace. But if you're not like us and you disagree with us, we'll find ways to punish you. And so the Russians, not surprisingly, as soon as they have the wherewithal to do so, they say, great, now the shoe's on the other foot. Yeah, we got a lot to learn, uh, and so do I, and I've learned a ton, and uh, it was great being with you, with, with you today, and uh, we'll definitely have to do this again. Always a pleasure. Just knock on the wall. Will do.